The new Porsche 991 Turbo has become so expensive, especially in Turbo S guys, that it kind of warrants comparison with other very expensive, very fast cars. So we've bought a McLaren along. So a bit of road, a bit of track, and then a drag race. How good is the new 911 Turbo? The latest 911 shape lends itself pretty well to the turbo treatment of wider rear arches and more gaping intakes than a basking shark. The GT3 legend has grown so fast over the past 10 years that the turbo has been rather forgotten, but for using every day and travelling at silly speeds, it's always in with a shout. The new model is bigger than the old 997 we tested earlier this year. Power is now 560 at 6,500 RPM. Torque is a twin turbocharged 516 foot-pounds with 553 on overboost. Like all turbos, since the 993 it runs full-time four-wheel drive. This S model is kind of designed to avoid having to option up a normal turbo. So the PDK transmission is standard, as are the ceramic brakes, 410 millimeters up front. This is one of the heaviest 911s ever made. It's 1,680 kilograms. It's also 141,000 pounds, which means it's potentially open to some very serious competition. For that kind of money, wouldn't you actually want a real supercar? Something to show the world just how minuscule your todger really is? Something like a McLaren? The list price of this McLaren is something north of 190,000 pounds but you can probably buy one for a good deal less than that if you wander into a McLaren dealership today. And in the world of supercar finance deals, 30 grand is the same as a pint and a pie. Whereas the Porsche uses a normal aluminium and steel shell, the 12C has a trick carbon tub. It weighs over 200 kilograms less and it has 625 horsepower. It has less torque than the Porsche, 443 foot-pounds, but then it'll comfortably top 200 miles an hour. But perhaps the funkiest thing of all about the yellow car is that the roof comes off. I asked for this car at short notice. McLaren couldn't source a coupe and offered a spider. Are you sure, I said, the Porsche's a coupe. Nah, it's just as stiff and only a little bit heavier. You'll be fine, they said. I love that type of confidence. So, which would be better at Anglesey Circuit? Okay, peeps, you know the form by now. Let's drive the car straight and then let the car move around a bit and try and find out what this MP412C, now called the 12C, um, is all about. I'm not sure a supercar has really caused so much conjecture and lack of agreement amongst people since, well, ever. I've never really sat on the fence with this car. I like it. I like what it stands for. I'm frustrated by some of the issues that McLaren has had with the car and I feel sorry for some of the owners because they've been frustrated, but there's no denying that the engineering in this car is compelling. So, 625 horsepower, not that much weight, a carbon tub, a double clutch gearbox, and I've got all the systems switched off. Okay, the torque is immense. You have to manage the entry speed, otherwise you get quite a bit of understeer. We're in track settings, so the, everything is very flat at the moment, very stiff. If you carry too much speed into the turn and back off, it will oversteer. And it's not the nicest lift-off oversteer either. Third gear, that's really fast now. What are we doing? 120-something, braking hard for the hairpin. Brakes are superb. Overstop the car, come back on yourself on the hairpin. That feels good. A little bit of oversteer on the exit. You have to be quick when it comes, otherwise you're in trouble. Remember this car has an open differential in this very complicated cross-linked hydraulic suspension system. It's got loads of traction and grip still. And the noise, okay, it's kind of fake, but it's pretty good from where I'm standing. Feel the load on through that fast left-hander. Air brake popping up behind me. This really is a weapon, this thing. But there's always a suspicion that it's a bit synthesized, that you're not quite in control of it, and that the computer's doing something. 
mid-corner sometimes, I wonder if a modem in the car doesn't sort of phone Ron Dennis and say, Ron, that's a small brown man cocking about with your car. Do something about it. It's mighty class though. And I do feel connected to it, but I feel connected to it in a sort of McLaren-y way, if that's the way to put it. Now, what happens if we start to let it move around? Well, it'll play the yobbo. It'll play the yobbo. But you have to be quite careful with it. That open diff means that it's not quite as predictable as you'd have hoped it might be. And of course, in conjunction with two turbochargers, quite a lot of lag. There's a bit of guesswork goes on. But you know what? I still like it. I still think it's a really interesting alternative to a 458. And it's fast. It's much quicker than a 458 in a straight line. I don't know where other magazines get their figures from, but from where I'm sitting, this thing feels like a step on in terms of performance. The 2014 991 Turbo S, is that what you call it? I don't know, it's 2013 at the moment as far as I'm concerned. 560 horsepower, 516 foot-pounds of torque. This thing is a weapon. But the Turbo has been quite a funny car for the last few generations, hasn't it? Lacking a bit of personality, particularly the 997 version, but incredibly capable. So it's a road car, but I'm driving on track because it's so fast on the road, you can't really tell anything about it without going to jail. What have we got then? Well, we've got this very clever rear steer system. That's the thing that dominates it for me because the car just feels so much more agile, particularly on initial turns, initial steering application, than you'd expect because it just goes. Um, everywhere on the circuit, I find it really, really gratifying. I just love the fact that I turn the front of the car and I'm into the corner. Strangely, it actually makes it feel lighter on initial turning than the McLaren, despite the fact that it's a lot heavier. It does flatter to deceive slightly, because once you get through that initial turn phase, the front axle slightly goes, oh, actually, I can't handle that, and you do get a little bit of understeer. At that point, you can peel off the throttle, and you end up with, you know, a little like that, a sort of, oh, sorry, a bit of an oversteer. Um, there's more personality in this powertrain than the last Turbo S's as well. We've got a lot more intake noise. They've tried really hard with that. We've got a sort of almost sort of poppy exhaust note. And there's a load of overrun chatter as well that I really quite enjoy. No, this is a much more interesting 911 Turbo than the last car, I think. It's also insanely fast. It doesn't feel an awful lot slower than the McLaren in a straight line, but we'll decide the winner of that particular battle later on in the video. As ever, the turbo is four-wheel drive, but it's kind of, you know, a rear-biased four-wheel drive. So you give it a hoof and it wants to go. And you get these massive great big drifts from nowhere. And it feels, it does feel very natural doing it. My one proviso is that for some reason, when I give it a hoof now, when I get to 5,000 RPM, I get that, you hear that cut? Bop, 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 bop. I've had this all day. I mean, this is about the most irrelevant piece of commentary about the 911 Turbo's performance that you could get. But if I'm mid-drift, there's something going on. If I get the car loaded up, it gets to 5,000 RPM and it sits there. It'll allow me to do it for about three seconds, it feels like. And then something cuts in the ECU and another light comes on the dashboard. I've got all the system switched off. And that's the way it happens. It's a, a pointless, I know, but I've always thought Porsche didn't do that kind of rubbish. That's not a Porsche-style trick. I'm running the car with all the systems off at the moment, but there's so much going on here. You've got Sport and Sport Plus, which are adjusting all your flipping throttle settings and everything else. You've got adjustable dampers. We can talk through some more of that in terms of its road behaviour. But from where I'm sitting, compared to the previous 911 Turbo, this is better on road and it's better on track. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> On the 
On the road, well, the Porsche is just sublime. The more time I spent in it, the more it felt like a huge improvement over the 997 version. Despite being too wide for UK roads, it's actually easier to place because the rear steering adds so much agility. It also hides the car's mass. It feels like a 1300 kilogram machine to drive and it's just so fast. The motor is awesome, traction and grip are insane, the suspension is supple enough and we all know just how fast these things are point to point. But now there's some decent intake noise to enjoy too. Amazingly, the McLaren with its dampers running soft is the better riding car. It's a freakishly calm machine on the street considering it'll do 200 miles an hour. The low scuttle gives a panoramic view out and the driving position is low and suggestive. But it doesn't give the same confidence as the Porsche. There's more turbo lag. You can't just scoot out of damp second gear corners without a thought. But then again, it's so much more of an event. And for this sort of money, isn't that what people want? This is quite an interesting drag race, this one. 625 horsepower of British two-wheel drive supercar versus 560 horsepower of German technology with four-wheel drive. Both cars have double clutch gearboxes. I mean, who can call it? Who can call it? And we're away. Porsche's got to leave off the line and it's gone. But watch this now. <laughs> that is immense. The McLaren has got so much grunt. We're already doing 150 miles an hour. It's at about 120, we got him. So zero to 120, I reckon the Porsche is even Stevens, but then now we're pulling 175, 180, 180, 185. That's 190, that's 192, 193, 194, 196 I gave up at. 196 miles an hour in the slowest McLaren you can buy. That is quick, that is proper quick. Notice I didn't do much talking at the beginning because it's so shocking. The Porsche takes it off the line, but it's only by about three quarters to a length of a car, maybe a length of a car. Which shows that the traction of this McLaren, given its two-wheel drive, is remarkable. Oh, I quite like that. Do you know what? Going fast in a straight line isn't very exciting, but when you start doing the thick end of 200, it's quite exciting. Victory to the McLaren. Of course, the numbers back up the visuals. The Porsche's traction advantage is much shorter lived than expected. It does 30 in 1.3, 60 in 3.2, and 107.9 seconds. But the Brit is beginning to disappear by then. It has hit 30 in 1.8, 60 in 3.7, and 100 in 7.6. It's one of the fastest cars we've driven all year, and above 100 miles an hour, it crucifies the Porsche. What surprised me most about this new turbo was how much I grew to enjoy spending time in it. The 997 was a car to respect, not to adore, and that wasn't really good enough given the money involved. But the 991 has a much more defined personality which reveals itself the more you drive it. It's also the fastest and most complete all-weather performance car I've ever driven, which must count for something. But you can't help but feel that the person who owned a Turbo S would really miss the drama of a machine like the 12C. It's not quite as usable, but you could live with it every day. And when it's dry, that power is addictive. The Porsche is the better, more complete car and can justify its new increased price. The McLaren remains one of the most exciting, usable supercars on sale. <laughs>